Thank you for coming to the threat modeling panel. We have uh, some great uh, panelists, panel members up here. I could do the introductions, but we're going to run out of time. So instead, I'm just going to show you this. You can get their taglines, contact info, and you can look up all the information about the BIOS and the schedule. So I'd like to start. Uh, we'll get some time for uh, questions at the end from the audience. Thank, thank you to those who already submitted their questions via SurveyMonkey. We've got a few of those, so some of those will be in here. Uh, first question, I'd like every panel member to give us a short answer, and then we're going to have a little more free-for-all discussion. So discuss problem experience with threat modeling, why it failed and how, what are we doing wrong, and how do we recover, make it succeed? Want to start? <laughs> uh, sure. And what the short answer, right? Yeah, the short answer. So uh, I, I think the biggest reason threat modeling fails is that threat modeling is like programming. There are lots of different paradigms, there are different languages, there are different tools, which you can use to meet some goal. And we talk about it as if it's a single thing, that you always have to do exactly this way, exactly that way. And when we break it out, when we make it more modular, we enable success. And so, for example, today Jonathan talked about the use of attack trees, which are, in my mind, are one way of answering the question, what can go wrong? There's other ways of doing it. Azar presented some checklists to help developers understand things. When you think of these things as the building blocks for a threat modeling program that will work for your organization, for the constraints which you have, you're much more likely to succeed than if you take one of the articles that any and all of us have written that say the way to threat model is, say the ways to threat model are. Um, as a CTO said, I won't name the CTO, but as the CTO said, don't we pay for static analysis? Doesn't that solve this problem? <laughs> no, but a pen test. Right, yeah, or, or the, the other one, um, we're going live tomorrow, can you do the threat model and we can we also have a pen test? That works. Um, so those are, those are ways that, that get out of it. We have to understand it's a process, but it's even more, and you know, to your point, and I think I'm just going to add some rather than, than disagree with anything you said, which is spot on from my experience as well. I, I would say that not getting, not taking the long journey. It's a long journey because it is a process. It is art. Um, it's very hard to hire enough pen, test, um, pen testers, threat modelers, but building them takes a long time, and management has to understand that you're not just going to buy a tool and it's going to be all over. Even if you do buy a tool, it'll take a long time to get, if you have enough constrained architectures that you can do that, it's going to take a while to get that, to get some use out of that, even that. So understanding the long, long term of the process um, is very, very important, and, and, and enabling. I'll let you, oh, you got one. So, um, in addition to, to what was said, for me, it's if the information doesn't flow, if things stay sealed, if people feel for some reason that they have to not share what they know, uh, that's when it fails big. And another place is when um, the ego gets in the way and the discussion with the team over the design becomes a contact sport. They think that you are trying to attack the design while actually you are just trying to make it more robust make it work better, and they take it personally and think that, no, you are in that room, you are starting that exercise to show to them everything that's wrong. So that's, in, in addition to what was said before, that that's where I see it failing big. So on my side, I don't think that really threat modeling can fail at all. Because if you're trying to do it and it is failing all over the place, maybe some people will help you, uh, or at least maybe you will have gone like one step really trying like going at trying, you know, to do threat modeling. So, and with the state of the industry right now, just being at that step, you're like already ahead of the others. And so I really do think that if you fail about it, well, of course you can learn and stuff, but it 
doesn't fail the process itself. And so, and I will even add that the more that you fail at doing it, and maybe the others will be engaged in helping you with it, and then you will build up like maybe something out of your own failure. So I would say the only thing is like, you have to try it, that's for sure. So if you wanna fail, just, just don't do nothing, right? And so, but uh, at least like uh, if you just try to do like a small bit of it, even if you don't understand anything, uh, one of the only, uh, the uh, only caveats that you can have is that maybe you try to do threat modeling, but what you're doing is not really threat modeling, but at least you're trying to do in that direction. So in my sense, uh, as long as we will try, you will get somewhere. Uh, maybe you won't be perfect, you won't be at a level of like maybe 30 years of experience, or I don't know, but at least if you wanna do it, you wanna try it, uh, like I know that there's basic stuff that you can do that you're going to win anyway, even if you think it's a total failure. So that's so it. So anyone want to comment more about uh, how I can succeed? You know. Well, I will say, come to my talk tomorrow, and I'll cover <laughs> this in great detail. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I, I think Jonathan is right that we get started. Um, someone, someone this morning. In, in your talk, ask the question of how do you get people off the napkin? Threat modeling at a whiteboard, brainstorming. You know, I created the Elevation of Privilege card game as a way to make threat modeling feel a little bit less threatening to those who had never done it. If that's all you do, that's a great way to get started. As you do it, you'll develop skill, you'll develop muscle memory, you can go deeper. But, but for the sake of controversy and arguing, I, I, I will say that there is a way to make threat modeling fail, and that's when those idiot developers just won't listen to us. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, but only a little. We, we in security do have this problem of thinking that we have the answers, and Really, what we need to do is we need to engage in dialogue. We need to explore design possibilities with people. And I think that the, the place that it fails is when our expectations are too high or when we let the egos get in the way. I'm, I'm just going to tag on that a little bit. This is so right on. Um, in that by involving as you were saying, Jonathan, by actually involving developers in the process, this opens up, e not even just dialoguing, I'm coming into dialogue, but involving the developers and the whole development team, something I'm gonna talk about tomorrow, I'm not pitching my thing, <laughs> but I am gonna go into this more tomorrow, is by involving the team, you, 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 you um, remove that barrier completely and we become one team working on the problem and besides it's fun attacking your system instead of getting into the you know coming in as you were saying but you know playing at attacking your system is really fun and you make it a game and suddenly you know we're all working together but with all that said there's one other way that I think that it does fail which is okay I, I agree every threat model that comes out of some finding is a good threat model but the problem is if you know that you are limited in the amount of, fi of findings that you're going to have because of the amount of knowledge that you have, but anyway, you declare that that's an extensive and complete threat model. You're not open to continue that later on. So if you assume victory while you're in a condition that you can't provide that victory, that to me is a fail. Yeah, and like uh, even the biggest effort you can put in any threat model, you, you can be doing like working on the same for years and then maybe somebody finds a new vulnerability or just like adds onto something that existed and then everything is gone and then there are some preconceptions that you had in your threat model before that was like, this is really secure so I trust it and then now, no it's not. And so if that's one thing I learned into security is that everything will get broken all the time. So. I'm, I'm not going to mention it because it is in my talk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the next question is, Agile now uh, and development is well the hot thing, you know, teams moving into that whether they need to or not. So how do you integrate threat modeling into Agile and Lean development methodology? Well, at, 
McAfee, we decided to make our SDL agile. Um, and it was, we had been working on it. Me and James Ransom had been working on this idea for a few years because we worked together before elsewhere. And we'd been working at it. And then I kind of went off and he went off a couple of other places and we came back together. We decided to make the whole thing agile and to make iteration our friend. And it's exactly what was just being said here. You, re, you iterate your threat model. So you have to have some triggers or some, some, some places where you want to um, revisit it that let you know that those are the triggers or the conditions that, that really focus on the threat model and, and it's revisiting. In that way, you let the agile process unfold because remember, it's about experimentation, it's about pivoting and understanding, and then your threat model or your security requirements get better too. Rather than coming in with the security requirements at the beginning, these are hard and fast. Everything else can change except these. Basically, what you'll get at the end is we couldn't do them because everything changed. So, so I'm, I'm going to go a little more tactical in my answer and say that when I work with Agile teams that treat Agile as a way to go faster by occasionally investing, for example, in test-driven development. You write a lot of tests so that you know that the changes that you're making don't break anything. And there's a team that I've been working with for a little while now, and they have a big wall chart that shows their entire system. Every sprint, and they invested in that. They, they spent effort to say this is what we have, and it was a good amount of effort, and it led to lots of refactoring that led to lots of bug reduction because of confusion about what was doing what that the architectural archaeology uncovered. But now they're so fast. I love watching them. What they do is they say, this is my user story for this sprint. It doesn't make any changes to this diagram, and then the next guy goes or the next gal goes and says, I'm adding a module here. It adds these three lines that cross these trust boundaries, and they do some threat analysis on those modules, on those lines, and they have a much more security intensive sprint than the first team. Another team might say, we're adding a, we're adding a couple of fields to this API. So new data is going across. We're gonna sit down and do an analysis process. It fits in with their two-week sprints because they put in effort up front to create a thing that lets them go faster. And then every now and then they go back and say, I think it's once a quarter, they're going back and saying, we're going to dig in and double check our work a little bit. And so this lets them work real two-week sprints. 90% 90, 90 of the user stories, no security impact. They've announced that to one another. People have a chance to raise their hand and say, but what about? It's, and so to me, they're, they're my model that I try and help other teams emulate because it's working so well for them in practice. You can hand it. So, since apparently pushing your own talk is a thing around here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this morning, I, I I talked a bit about uh, what seemed to, to work in one of the last places that uh, I tried something like that. And the thing with that model is that you, you have to call it a, a living document, especially in Agile. The thing is not touch, fire, and forget. So having someone who is responsible for keeping that thing alive and making sure that stories that might somehow uh, touch or change the threat model, that as soon as they get completed, they get notified back to that person who's responsible. And that comes in the, then comes in the, the point of uh, personal ownership. The person who actually did that story go, comes up with what they did and how that changed in large the attack surface or um, added a new secret, a new piece of sensitive material, something like that. And that back and forth between who did and who keeps the thing is what keeps the, the, the living document in, in sync with what's, what's in the system. So that's all very good. Uh, again, one of my main arguments here is that when you have the time and with everything agile, it's like, oh yes, uh, you start next week on this project and they are already doing that, do threat modeling. 
Um, when is the when it's actually the first step that you're trying to make a model? It takes an awful long time, right? Because you, you have to understand maybe the system you didn't understand before. You have to line up the threads and everything. So agile is really great when you want to do like small iterative things, like and then you follow up with your thread model and you just update them. But the reality is most of the time you start from scratch on something you never worked on, and then you're like. Okay, this is agile. So it just means for me that I have to go quicker. So I have to be like more fast at modeling my stuff and then jump into the bag wagon than if it would be in other other team. Or I can just decide to budge and just say uh, I will super scope on this. Like uh, like I will on purpose miss a few of the things that I will have done in a real good threat model because right now I need to produce this and I need to be focused because normally when they are agile, they, they, they don't like a lot if you screw up a sprint. Uh, you must have a way of inserting your outputs into their sprint inputs and this will always take like one sprint or two after because you, you will like derange the planning even if agile is supposed to have no planning. It's like all I see is like sprints with like a deadline anyway. Uh, and so when you're not afraid just to have uh, a part of the threat model that works good enough and then you go iterate over it. So you can either do that or like myself, you just work over time the first time and then you try it and then you say, yes, I will re reuse it later. And so the more that you can re reuse your stuff uh, by doing threat modeling, the better it is. And so I assume that if you start on the job and you add, like, I don't know, an onboarding of one month or two, just basically talking with the business, doing all the stuff, and you come prepare, th then you could jump and be like not overwhelmed that much. But if not, you will have to cut some corners, I think, to achieve it. Uh, and a quick follow up, actually, for uh, Jonathan. Uh, ha about <laughs> we had a question on uh, version control ideas and threat modeling. What did I do wrong? <laughs> so, oh, oh, yes, um, about version control. Uh, if you saw my talk, because I guess I'll be the last one to plug it. Uh, Adam, you don't have <laughs> any talk, huh? I don't have a talk to plug. Uh, I'm so uh, sorry. I'm really sorry <laughs> for you, man. Uh, <laughs> 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 and so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, one of the things that you can do aside playing the card game is to have it in code. And so that way, in my example that I had this morning was an attack tree. So instead of doing it on a napkin or blah, blah, blah. And so you just try to have some code that will define it either using UML and all that stuff. And then you just version this. And so that could be a way. Uh, another thing that I do as well is when you have a flow diagram, I al always make version of it. Again, if you go back to my slide, you see the progress. Well, a real one will get super messy and then at some point it will change. And so it's actually useful to understand uh, your, your actual train of thought and also the development of an application over time. So if you are doing some version control of just the screenshots of what you're doing uh, into your uh, actual threat modeling system, and then you view that over time, it gives you like a neat uh, way of visualizing where we might add some risk because you see the new processes, you see the new applications coming like into light and plus if you are adding notes uh, and things into your diagram then you will see it. So it's not really like versioning as cool as with the attack tree that you can do it with code but because it's graphical that's the only thing we have so that's my answer for that. Yeah. Uh, then uh, I would like to see how threat modeling, uh, can you do you standardize templates and methods for threat modeling and validating applications? Yeah, so before he starts with the lot to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if this really counts as templates or not, but for a long time I've worked with a process that was based on a threat library. And that threat library derived from the things that historically appeared more in the products that were using that, that process. And it worked, it worked well, actually, uh, by giving people a starting point that was less abstract than, say, things poofing. It actually gave them something that, hey, it happened on another product a while ago, it could happen to you tomorrow. So if we call that a template, then I, I would say that in that sense it was successful. Now we can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, 
when I when I work with teams that are doing things, they often ask me for a checklist. Give me all, give me a template. Give me all the things that can go wrong. And I say, are you doing something new and different? And they say, of course we are. And they explain all those new things. And attackers do new and different things to what they're working on. And so I think there's always going to be a little bit of unique custom thinking around threat modeling. But I want to pitch not my own work, but Fraser Scott is doing an OWASP project called Cloud Security. And what he's doing is he's developing standardized threat and mitigation libraries for cloud components. So he has one, for example, for Amazon S3 buckets. And so I think that sort of templating where you can say, hey, this is an S3 bucket. This is a MySQL database. These are the things that you as the consumer of this need to understand and do. And these are the things we do for you so that there's some explicit, so that you don't have to engage in the rediscovery and reanalysis. That sort of templating is great. And we're just starting now to see how to do that and how to make that work effectively. So um, my friend Catherine Blackadder Nelson, at, when we were both at Intel, had started down this line as well, building, and the problem is, uh, building a set of, of standard uh, threats, let's call them threats, I don't like that word there, but let's call them threats, and standard mitigations. The problem is something like CWE is too low and for, for thinking architecturally, and um, then if you say really high level like the 10 that Isar and I worked on, the 10, you know, avoiding the 10 biggest design flaws, it's actually way too high. To, to help you too much except to give you some ideas, right? And there's some good examples in there, I hope. But um, nevertheless, you know, there's this in-between place where, but, and they're very standard. I mean, if you think about webs, how many times have I said, or my, my co-panelists here, said to someone, you have to check your inputs on this web. If I never say that again to another team, I will be very, very happy because it's really cut and dried. We know the answer to that, how to avoid cross-site scripting or, or what we need to do. There are very particular things to do that you can do that we understand. If we could just get those written down, I think that would be a big, big help. And there are some tools out there. I'm not pitching any tools. I don't have any interest in any of the threat modeling tools. But you know, people are working on this problem in the commercial space, too. Um, they're not going to get, as you said, I don't think they're going to get to the new analysis. We still need human analysis. But at least if we could get the sort of standard stuff taken care of, then we wouldn't always be saying, well, you, you got you know, you to check your inputs on this field. Um, because that's, that's obvious. That's kind of my, my theory, is that we could write down the obvious stuff. And I've encouraged people to do something like this OWASP project a bunch of times over the last like 10 years or so. And I'm glad that somebody's doing it, because I haven't seen the work. Catherine put her work down. It would have been a perfect to, to write a book or something about this. And she put it down and went to Google and is doing something else. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I still love Catherine, but you know, she's not doing that. So on that, I will have the next uh, let's see question for uh, maybe 400 on the board, please, Aral. Thank you. <laughs> So you can discuss new methods, tools, and approaches that work best for cross-functional teams. You guys, I'd like to buy a vowel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I've got a lot to say about this. Uh, um, I, I'll try to be brief. Um, I, again, I, I haven't found, so I've been doing these, these threat modeling trainings, which have taught me a huge amount, uh, running around the world doing them for McAfee and for Intel, and now, now, now I'm not doing them anymore for McAfee, but some other organizations too. And the thing I want to say, and this is again in my talk, so I'm sort of previewing my talk and you don't have to come tomorrow, um, is participatory is really important. I've had a lot of trouble doing remote trainings because the people who are remote just be quiet and they try to tr absorb it as though it were a one-way conversation. And to your point, to do threat modeling, to really learn how to do it and get over the hump, it's about support and empowerment as, and facilitation as it is 
you know, for those of us who are experienced, as it is anything else. Of course, I bring a lot of experience about what attacks are probably likely and what are not for a lot of different kinds of systems. Of course I bring that. That's the heart of my art. But I try to keep my mouth shut and let other people try to come up with it first. And that way I'm empowering them and I can help them. And that works best so far, and I'm thinking about this with Chris Romeo and, uh, and Robert's part of that little group there. Robert's great threat modeler. He's right there. Should probably be up here too. Um, but uh, um, I'm, where I'm trying to think about how would we do this remotely, and I really don't have a really great, I really like in person. It seems to work best, and I've tried remote, so I sort of give that to you folks. You know, have you had better success? Let me let me start with the cross-functional thing and then avoid the remote question because it's really hard and I don't have a good answer. Okay, Oops, well, I wasn't enough. supposed to say that. Um, the the cross-functional thing, I don't think of threat modeling as something for them. It's something that you do with them that mm -hmm. brings security through the door because when you have a cross-functional team of database people and network people and performance people, security often doesn't have a seat at the table. And I was talking, I was talking with someone over lunch about the security confrontational approach to things and why that gets us excluded from these meetings. And I think that threat modeling the act of diagramming together at a whiteboard, the act of walking through threats together, it's not for the cross-functional team. It's a way for security to have a useful seat at the table without saying all of the negative things that we might otherwise say. And so I think that, that threat modeling is best as a collaborative activity, and collaborative activities are best in person, but our organizations today don't support that all the time. And, I, you know, I, I'd love to hear about a team that is really successfully engaged in difficult trade-off discussions where all of the members are remote. I would love to know how to make that work because I see it fail. I see siloization. I see ego dominating in that circumstance. And it's bad for the organizations that we try and help. So I got nothing on remote. So uh, I, I, I haven't got anything to, to add to that. I, I agree completely. Just one experience that I had with a, a cross-functional team, and that one stayed with me. When it came to, to diagramming, we just overlaid uh, transparent pieces of plastic, and each one of the different functions diagrammed on top of the same system their own data. So we, we could always take out those annotations to see something in particular, put them to add some more data, and look at the thing. I guess that today you could do that with a bunch of stencils, Visio or not. But the fact that we had that discussion there and these things appearing and disappearing as, as needed added a lot to, to the discussion. So apparently I will be the only saying this. So there's a thing that is called share screen when you do a like an online meeting or something. Really? And then, yeah. Really? I yeah. did work at WebEx for a <laughs> while, but I never heard of that. No, no, don't. <laughs> like, there may be n no solution that are good, but if you have anything that share a screen, and you come a bit, let's say, prepare, and then you show something, and then you make modification as it goes with the people on the other side. So what they will see is a screen with your threat model on, and they will see it move around. Because if you're using any graphical tool, uh, you basically can change, rename, add notes, and things like that. So it helps a bit. Of course, it's easier when you're in front of people in order to argue. But uh, in some of the actual cases that I did it remote, uh, like I was, let's see, clear enough. My argument were like I made my argument stronger, and also the actual people, because I, I was the guy remote at, at the headquarters who was doing that. You have more weight, you know, and so they're just listening at you, and so they help you. So as long as you can share a screen, and you you have your stuff on the screen, I, I don't know, maybe you have like a super good webcam and a whiteboard, but on the screen it's like always easy. 
One thing I would like to uh, maybe see one day is to do it in another, uh, let's say, collaborative way, like using a online document that everybody can edit. You know, at the same time, maybe there's some web solutions, like I don't know much uh, about them, but maybe there's a web solution that you can make diagram, but then it's actually collaborative as well, right? Uh, and so with that, you basically could have a chat or either a voice chat with people and then just update it. And so you won't have the same impact as uh, when, you when you want to influence people. But normally, those people who are always working remote, that's all they do anyway. And so if they are doing go good doing remote work, understanding requirements and they're delivering code and stuff like that, w why not they won't be able to do threat modeling if at least you try? So just follow, follow up on that a, a bit. Uh, I'm going to be the uh, old curmudgeon. And you're working remote. People are looking at your, your shared screen, and my problem with that is engagement. Like nowadays, we are all in a, in a, in a room, and how many of us have uh, Facebook or Twitter open and something? <laughs> <laughs> Basically <laughs> listening to us there in the background, but in your own bubbles. And uh, when you do that kind of, uh, of sharing, and you have one engineer in here, one engineer there, and uh, <laughs> don't. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> It wasn't, but just it was. But, uh, uh, and, and you fail to get people engaged in what you're doing, and that removes from the amount of detail that they're will, willing to pitch in and from the amount of uh, stuff that they're willing to think about when they're talking to you. And actually, that's something that I took from your talk today. Now, now we are cross plugging. <laughs> something that I got from yours, the, the approach of throwing something wrong to get them engaged by, th that's something that I'll definitely start using. And it justifies when I get something wrong. So <laughs> what I like to do is I like to get them, I say, you know, you've been living with this design, even though I've probably threat modeled well over a thousand systems. Probably, I, I lost count when I was at Cisco, I, I'm not Cisco, uh, Intel, uh, since I was on their safe review panel, two or three times a week I'd see another system. So I, I lost count after about 800, and I have no idea. But um, I've seen a lot of systems. So I'm pretty fast at, at picking up what's going on. But I, instead, I kind of look at them and say, you've been living with this system. You have to explain it to me. I have no idea what this thing does and how it works. And that's, that's another engagement technique, manipulation, no, technique, <laughs> that I use uh, to get people to, to, you know, sort of like your mistake, to get them to do it and explain it to me. Because then you get them starting to talk to each other about, well, really, it doesn't work that way. No, actually, it's over here, and this is how it works. And 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 you know, one person goes to the board and they draw a bit <coughs> and a bit, and then the the next person says, "Wait a minute, that's not right. This works like this." And you get them talking. One of the greatest things about a threat model, participatory threat model session, is everybody actually finally understands the system that's under <laughs> design. So, so Gary McGraw used to say that. The only thing you need for a threat model is a locked room with a whiteboard and a bunch of architects. And you just don't let them out until they're done arguing with one another. <laughs> and while that can work, the reason I like using structure is because it gets you out of some of the rat holes. But, but I, wanna, I wanna touch on the explain this to me because I think there's an important distinction that's sort of implicit here, which is the consultant, the internal consultant, the external consultant, or the team member doing threat modeling. And I've become a huge fan of driving threat modeling to the people who are actually building the product. I never again want to have to say, tell me how this thing works, because I've been there. I can do it as a training engagement. I can do it because they need some help. But really, if the team themselves own the work that they're doing, if they have that pride of ownership, instead of the often, you're coming in here to, to mess with our stuff, uh, conf conflicted relationship that a reviewer has. So we found ourselves doing it, yes, but, let, but I wanted to be explicit that there are different models. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I really could not agree. He's so elegant the way he expresses things. I feel like a complete idiot up here <laughs> next to Adam because he, he takes my words and then, and then he 
builds on it and he expresses it so beautifully. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Oh, we have uh, an original thought. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> oh, come on, Adam. Um, so what you don't know is that years ago, right when, right after um, uh, uh, Elevation of Privilege came out, we downloaded the bloody cards, got them printed out. We were doing this uh, Michelle Gell's Security Knowledge Empowerment at Cisco for the first time. And me and Vinay Bansal and Michelle were the teachers. And we got out Elevation of Privilege. And we used it to get people to start the threat model. I mean, it's a, it's a fabulous thing. Um, so just, just so you know, big fan. Um, but uh, what was I going to say about, about this? Um, explain it to me is part of my trick, and maybe it's just a personal trick, for moving it exactly as you say, moving it into their, their domain. And in fact, threat modeling is, is an interesting piece, and I don't quite know why this works this way, but if you get people to play at, and I use that word, that verb, very, very consciously, to play at attacking the system, no matter how skilled they are or unskilled, it doesn't matter. Even, and I invite everyone, I got this idea from Owen Carroll, and, and I talk about it in the book, and I'll probably mention it tomorrow, but, um, but I got the idea originally from Owen Carroll, who's one of my, my peers, or someone I've worked with for many years, but I want to give him credit for this, um, that if you involve everyone on the development team, including the project managers, including the product manager, all these people who are, you know, may not be technical, they may not contribute a lot, but they all get the entire SDL after attacking their system. It's probably the most magical thing, and I use that word guardedly, but it's the most magical thing I have experienced in my work is to just get everybody, you know, you, the, the most experienced people are going to finish the threat model, as has been said here. But making every, getting everybody involved in this and owning it it's more than the threat model they own. Mm -hmm. They come to own the entire SDL for their product because that's the testing, that's the, you know, the early design work and the early thinking about security requirements. The entire thing starts to make sense because they've been playing the role of attacker. It's, if I could leave you with one thing, no matter what we say here or, and tomorrow, get everybody on your teams involved and stop owning threat modeling give it to the teams, exactly what you were saying, because it's powerful. It's really powerful for your whole software security program. Okay, I'm going to have to stop that there. I have a couple of questions more to get in. <laughs> so what's the uh, future of threat modeling look like? What's changing? And uh, any software tools make sense to use? Well, I have talked to everybody who's got a commercial tool out there that I know of. Um, for some reason they come to me, maybe because it's the book out there or whatever, but I have talked to everybody. And there are tools out here. I want to say you can do go download a uh, threat modeling tool from Microsoft and it does some stuff. I watch a lot of our people, they go through our training and then they, this, these are beginning security architects, and then they run, they, they, they connect flow. I love that. I'm stealing it. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, connection flow diagram, because I hate double-headed arrows, um, it's a pet peeve, um, and, they, and then they run that through TMT and they get the whole long thing and at least it starts the conversation. They almost invariably come to someone senior and say, oh my gosh, do I have to do all of this? And then you can have the prioritization conversation and they take another step. But it's, it's great, it's free. Um, it does something and gets, it's another tool to get the conversation going, but there are commercial tools. There's the requirements approach if you have enough um, uh, homogeneity in your systems. Um, there's the, uh, there's uh, Archie Argawal's um, threat modeler, which allows you to make pictures of, of fairly standard systems, and then he has a lot of requirements built into it. There's, a, there's some stuff out there, and there's Steven, and I, it begins with a V, and I forget his last name in Barcelona. Yeah, that's it. Um, and, and he's got a risk-based system. You know, take a look out there, because people are working on this problem. 
I would say that you don't need a threat modeling tool when you have just a modeling tool, because really, frankly, most of the modeling tools can do most of the job. Maybe they won't be tied directly to threats and won't try to list it. But every time I, I try to do that with a bigger tool, it was way too much for me. So I needed it more simpler. So if you want to use MS Paint and draw some stuff in it, you can. It will be a valid threat model, I think, and it will be a valid threat modeling tool in that situation. So there's a few things that I use that are like open source to draw like diagrams and everything like that. So anything you're at ease with it or uh, in an enterprise, let's say, uh, environment, it's anything that you know that everyone has that actually plugs well with the wiki, maybe that plugs well with other things, then it, it can be your go-to tool. So it doesn't need to be like, this is made for threat modeling and I just pay the vendor for it. It can be like, so I'm really sorry if anyone is trying to sell that, <laughs> but like. I have no interest in any of these companies. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's like, and so go MS Paint. Yeah, but the, the one thing to keep in mind is that as good or perhaps not so good as they could be, uh, those these tools are, they are a function of what you're putting in. They mostly act on annotations on your model, so garbage in, garbage out. If you don't take the time to annotate them and do that annotation right and actually express your system the way it is, the result you're going to get is just, sorry, lost time. And some of these tools are going to give you a lot of uh, noise. They are going to look at the lowest common denominator that they can do and just start spewing 3,000 times the same, the same threat in different ways. So again, it's, it's all a function of what you put in. Uh, so I, well, let me go to mostly to the other half of the question, which was about the future of threat modeling. And I think the future of threat modeling is modular. And I saw a tool uh, a few months back by Tudomenic, I think it's called, from Jeff Hill. It's super early, and all it does right now, all, I'm putting, uh, for the audio I'm making little air quotes, but all it does is it takes a Visio diagram to a cloud service and returns an Excel spreadsheet of threats. And the thing that I really didn't understand for a long time is why that's so darn important. And the reason it's important is because of modularity. The threat, mo uh, so I did not the current Microsoft threat modeling tool, but the SDL threat modeling tool that preceded it, the one that was Visio dependent, I'm sorry. Uh, but that was an IDE, right? That was the visual studio of threat modeling tools. And what Tudomenic has created is the Lint or the GCC of threat modeling tools. It's a different model of what a tool can be. And it took me a long time to figure out why it was relevant because I was stuck in IDE land. And I think as we think about modularity, as we think about being able to say, are we using MS Paint or connection flows or UML or whatever to model and then use different tools to do the analysis, what can go wrong, that will we'll start to get better faster because we can distinguish between the things we're doing, and actually, I'm, I'm gonna send you email, but I'm gonna tell you this. You should put your connection flow thing on GitHub and define it precisely so that people can compare and say that this is what this is, this is how it relates to other things, so that we're crisply defining the changes that we're making, so that people who haven't been in this room can say what's the difference between this and that, and get a crisp answer Modularity helps with that, because when we've got these big complex things where there's 17 steps and this tool and that tool and this version control and this integration with this company's cross-functional matrix over six continents, what's different between my cross-functional matrix and your cross-functional matrix is hours of conversation, which we've never had, but they absolutely happened between you know, our former employers. So modularity is going to be the future. I think I'd like to open it to the audience if there is a question. Anyone? <coughs> if someone was going to just begin and start in threat modeling, where would be a good place to start? Like they know other areas of security, but they haven't done this before. They're so books. what would be, if someone was just beginning threat modeling, what would be a good area to start? 
their books? I, no, I'm, I'm going to say not my book. My book, is, my book is way too long at 600 pages for anyone to get started with. Um, you have to read the whole thing in one state. Well, no. Play Elevation of Privilege. It's Creative Commons licensed. You can buy physical copies in a bunch of different places. Um, that's the way to get started. That was the goal of the game, was to get people started. And for some, you know, some ideas about design, that was the whole idea for the 10, avoiding the 10 design flaws. Again, Creative Commons is free. Just go to IEEE, search for either, you know, avoiding the 10, 10 most common design flaws or Center for Secure Design. It's right there. Download the PDF. Read that, and at least it gives you some design stuff to think about. That's, you know, that's as good as anything, you know, and, and they're, they're great starts. And just play with it. You know, look at a system and think about who, uh, this goes to exactly what you were saying. First, what are the goals of the threat agents I'm aware of who are active against systems of this type? I'm going to phrase it a little bit differently, but it's the goal is very important because that tells you a lot about the assets that are under, that are, that are attractive, right? Because you can't do every asset. You wind up a big long list, right? And then start with that and then think, what do they usually do to achieve those goals, those attackers? And you start building that tree and then you look at your architecture and say, you know, where are the exposures? So I get into this, this it's not really a methodology, but it's a, it's a pedagogy that I call atasm, and it's architecture, um, threats, attack surfaces, and mitigations. And that's, you know, just a way of thinking about this. And there's no, the ordering there is not that important, except you can say it in English. Um, and, you know, atasm, it's pronounceable in English. Um, but the idea here is to start really at these high concepts rather than trying to go for something more precise and just start looking at the system and thinking in those terms. That'll get you started, I think. And uh, all these references, both the game, the books, the paper by the IEEE, uh, they are in the paper by Safe Code, the tactical threat modeling, which doesn't look at threats, but looks at the different uh, methodologies out there with some examples of how people use them, uh, applied to different areas. Disclaimer, both Isar and I contributed to both of those. And uh, <laughs> Safe Code also has a free threat modeling 101 uh, training module. Right now, a lot of people know that I don't like long training modules, but that one specifically is, is pretty good because it, it gets you through the whole process and shows a bit more of how things get tweaked here and there. Okay, we have two minutes left. You want to have some uh, lasting... Uh, I think that the last words is go out and do it because that's the only way that you're going to, A, get, get good at it, experience the whole thing. And I, I think that, as Jonathan really said, there isn't a bad threat model. It uh, may be incomplete. It's not a bad one. C can, I, can I add one thing? No. And then find <laughs> someone experienced and have them look at your threat model. That's really, really good. Um, <laughs> well, you, can, you can disagree. Well, I think that's really great, and I've seen that work very, very well. Wax on, wax off. Don't get criticized after the first bit of wax goes onto the dock. <laughs> do it again, do it again, do it again. You'll find interesting things as you do it. If you find, and, and I, I, I find myself in this situation often. People will show me something, and I have to hold myself back because I am naturally critical and argumentative. And that is not helpful for a beginner. Um, so... Yeah. But I'm not naturally argumentative or <laughs> critical. Um, I w yes, you are. <laughs> yes, I am not. You're right. Sorry. Maybe I should argue with myself. I, d I do think that, that, that finding someone who's done it before and showing your work to them and talking through it is very useful. That's all I was trying to say. <laughs> or you can go to Adam and he'll keep his, he'll bite his tongue so that. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. I would like to thank Adam, Brooke, Israel, and Jonathan.